So why don't we get started? So thanks guys for joining. We're a few minutes in. So today we'll start with taking a quick look at XM Cloud, um, what that looks like. I'll give you a quick walkthrough, a live walkthrough of a demo instance set up, just give you a little bit of an insight and, into the user interface, some things that are coming with it. But here joining us is Justin and Andy uh, from the product team. So I hope you brought your questions with you. Justin, Andy, welcome. So Thank you, uh, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for the support once again. So hope, hope everybody brought your uh, questions um, with you. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes for the Q&A after a quick walkthrough. Uh, and then we'll dive into the sessions. We'll have a couple of sessions today, one on content modeling, content hub, probably one of the most important topics about content hub implementations. And then the second session will be on using Cypher personalized and uh, CDP for something different, employee experience, something we don't think about a lot, but the space is blowing up. I was just about to tell mode before everybody started joining, we're even at all two starting to look into employee experience and starting to experiment there as well. So curious to see what Mo has in store for us. Alrighty, so without further ado, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And let me know when you guys can see it. Yep, we're good. All right, so let me actually start here. So what's the portal? Um, they get access to once you get, so the preview access. Now, remember everything that you guys are gonna see here is subject to change, obviously. This is, um, you know, a lot of things are moving, a lot of things are shifting, a lot of things are in development. So uh, what you see here, you know, may not be what you'll see, you know, in a month or two or it's like your symposium, for instance, right? But this should give you a good insight. And, and a lot of things that are, that are here are pretty solid and then I'll, I'll touch on them. So in, in the portal, once you log in, you. One of the things I love is there's access to documentation on the right. So um, easy, quick way to access, especially you know for, for someone unfamiliar with Sitecore, quick links to the documentation on the right side, support on in at the top in the top navigation, uh, the uh, placeholder icon. Oh, did I get logged out? No, okay. Uh, takes us into selecting different sites, so we can set up different projects. So different websites here. This is where we can navigate uh, across different projects. We can add members to the portal to have access to the portal. As you can see, we're at Altitude, we're pretty excited about getting access to, to this demo portal. So we have two pages of users already playing around with this and experimenting. Uh, setting, up, setting up a new project, new website, very straightforward. Uh, so if we, um, uh, let's see here, quick actions. So there's a, before we set up a project, so there was a um, create a project. Let me see here, da, 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 manage my projects. There way there's a, a, a CTA button to start creating projects. Once you click on it, there we go, create a new project. Gives you, gives you an option. I start from a start a template, start from your existing some cloud code. So this is a good option. Uh, to start with if you already have the code, right? And you're deploying, let's say, dupe environment, for instance. Uh, if you have source code and um, Git, for instance, uh, you can deploy that using the Cycle pipeline. Here, what I did is I simply followed the template, um, chose to start with a template. There's a starter kit, Play Summit demo. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Play Summit demo. So I picked that, hit next, give the project a name, Hit next, then it would, uh, what it does is it asks you to connect your GitHub account. So this is going to be your um, enterprise account. This is, this is uh, the account where the source code for the project is going to be stored. So because we're deploying from starter template, uh, the source code is going to be pulled into, in this case, my GitHub account once I connect it, and then it will be deployed from there, right? So once, once I hook that up, Pick, pick the repository, pick the connection, and then off we go and it starts, starts deploying. So super simple to get, get up and running. I, I think, you know, it was super quick, super intuitive, very easy to get going. Um, 
right out of the gate. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get back to back out of this, back into the home. See here. So uh, if we, so here we have a couple of projects. Get into it. BSG, BSG demo. This is the one that I'll be using. So there's some functional areas around the project, but I, what I want to get into is the interface. So I'm just going to plug directly to it. So this is our launch pad. And it looks like a we're getting a facelift, right? Uh, for the launch pad, it definitely looks cleaner. So some of the usual tools we're used to seeing in Sitecore, starting from the bottom, run access management, our security tools, right? Excited to see PowerShell IC being part of the launch pad. Um, I think it's, a, it's definitely an important tool. No, no Sitecore build should ever go without PowerShell extensions, um, in my opinion. And then we get into the new tool. So one of, one of the new tools here is Cycro Pages. So this is the tool that seems to be the new name for, and um, you guys, Justin, Mandy, correct me if I'm wrong, feel free to jump in at any point if I say something that isn't aligned with reality, but this is uh, built on top of Horizon. And right? so this, if we um, go into it, let me switch back to that. So this is the interface we're used to seeing, right, from Horizon. This is uh, Pages. So we have the Summit website, demo uh, demo implementation built, automatically set up, rolled out using that template, um, ready to rock and roll, right? So if you're familiar with Horizon, you'll see a lot of familiar things here, right? So um, the navigation here is, is smooth. We have, have a, a library of components here out of the box. Oh. Bug. It's Looks like fixed. I switched context. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see here. If you copy that URL and then uh, paste it in again, refresh, you'll, you'll eventually get it. There you go. Ah, yeah. sh developer shortcuts. <laughs> Taking notes. Taking notes. So, uh, the, the UI, I mean, if you, if you use Horizon, you, you're, you're familiar with it, right? So the UI is mobile optimized. So there's um, familiar functionality, smooth, smooth experience. We can pick our websites here. So everything, if, if you've ever um, worked with um, Horizon, you'll, you, you'll, you'll find this very familiar. I think there's some additional functionality and some additional features um, that are being added to, uh, to this, but for the most part, it's, you know, what we're, uh, looking at is the horizon show, right? An improved horizon. Um, if you haven't worked with horizon, I do encourage you to start looking into it. And the experience is much smoother, much more streamlined. I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's, a, it's almost a pleasure to work with it. It's just, I am a stickler for the experience. So the animations, the little things, the little details, right? So that make the experience pleasant. And it's just, Horizon is just a nice place to be compared to Experience Editor. Um, you know, it's smooth, the transitions are smooth, you know, animations are, make sense. You know, the, the whole experience kind of gives off that nice, I don't want to say Apple-like, Apple, Apple -like, but it's, it's, this is what I think about when I think about the, the new animations, the new experience, right? It's, it's, it's smooth. Um, so then if the rest of the tools are similar, uh, whoop, I was, lost my tabs. Here. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. This pop up is blocking road. So if we get back into this, there we go, into the launch pad, the rest of the tools are um, still similar. So headless CMS, this one I am really excited about. So it's, it's not available right now. Workbox is the same Workbox tool that we, we, we're used to. Media Library, Content Editor are the same tools. Um, Experience Editor seems to still be around. So I actually, actually have a question on that one. So I'll save it for later. Um, and then we have you know, the, the Content Explorer and the pages, the new tool. So here's a second tab here. So if you're working with multiple sites, here below the dashboard, you can switch site contacts. If you're working with large numbers of sites, you can, you'll be able to use something like the search 
capability. All right. So, and then uh, editing in pages and editing in Explorer. So some context menu functionality. So this is in a nutshell, super quick walkthrough um, of the experience. I mean, the rest, the, the functional areas of the website, once you get into the, the tools that we're already familiar with, pretty similar to what we're used to. Um, I think the biggest, the, the biggest things, the biggest changes are going to come with pages, with components tool, right? So um, components and headless, headless CMS. All right, do you guys have any questions um, on any of this? Do you, would you like me to explore any, any particular area here before we get into the q and got a question. Um, more the, the, uh, is it GitHub only? I, I noticed there's only a, a option for GitHub. Ah, huh, great uh, question. So what, uh, Justin, Andy, I'll-, I'll Yeah, I can take that one. Yep, uh, the experience that uh, Vasily showed was using our deploy app. And in our deploy app, we have an integration with GitHub. However, you can use any source control provider that you like. If you're using a source control provider other than GitHub, you won't have that same wizard experience that uh, you saw in the demo just now. Instead, you would use our CLI or you would do your own custom CI CD pipelines and do your integration with your source code system that way. Um, but all are supported. Additionally, would love to hear feedback on what your teams and customers are using for source control providers so that we can in the future expand on uh, what we offer for GitHub. GitHub was a initial choice because a lot of our front end hosting providers integrate with GitHub. GitHub is really popular in the community um, and the connector was fairly simple to, for us to in, implement for the first pass. Yep. Did that answer the question? Yes, that was perfect, thank you. Yeah. And, and we sort of dove into it without um, doing the introduction. So maybe Justin, Andy, you guys can quickly introduce yourself and then we'll get into the rest of the, uh, the Q&A. Just so, so the team, if they haven't met you, I don't know, Andy, if there's anyone on this call who hasn't met you, but uh, uh, you know, if you could just give a couple words about yourself, what you do, what your role is on the um, XMC project so the guys can have the right context and ask you the right questions. Sure. Uh, I'll start. I'm uh, Andy Cohen. I am a system architect at Sitecore. I was the architect or one of one of the architects on Experience Edge, and then I moved over to XM Cloud. Um, before that, I was at three different partners. I was at Horizontal with Justin, actually, for many years. Then I've also worked at Avanade and Proficient as well. So that's me. Awesome. Justin? Yeah, hey everyone, Justin Vogt, uh, as Andy mentioned, he and I used to work together in a partner agency. Spent about 10 years doing partner implementations on top of Sitecore, and then moved into product management at Sitecore about a year and a half ago. Focused on developer experiences, XM Cloud, Deploy App, and I get involved in some other things as well. Happy to answer any questions on XM Cloud. Um, I think Andy and I can answer most of them. Awesome, Justin, Andy, thanks guys for joining. Thank you for supporting the community once again. So let's open it up um, to you guys. Go ahead and just uh, jump in with uh, whatever questions you have. This is your chance to pick, pick their brain on um, what's in XMC, what's, what's gonna be coming out, what you should expect, how things work and so forth. So really wondering what is Headless CMS coming soon? What's underneath this button? Sure, I'll take that. Um, the CMS is, uh, it's a contentful compete, I would say. It is, uh, it has a lot of the look and feel of Content Hub, just the CMP portion. It has a streamlined um, entity model. Uh, it doesn't have all of the Content Hub, like M underscore prefixes for all the GraphQL stuff. It's meant to just get up with, uh, really quickly with pure content. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically just pure content modeling, uh, also accessible uh, via Edge, uh, GraphQL, and uh, we should be able to reference the data sources in XM as well. Um, I, I guess that's something that uh, the components 
product is going to be able to do. It's going to be able to reference data sources from many, many different places, headless CMS, XM, um, content, whatever you want, just raw JSON. Yeah. So sometimes we get the question of is XM Cloud, does, do they offer a pure headless uh, solution? And for me, the headless CMS offering will be that pure headless play where it's data modeling and content that's delivered and you have freedom and flexibility to do whatever you want with that raw data. Whereas with XM Cloud, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a hybrid um, headless where we're combining some layout and presentation with your modeling data. Um, I, I, don't, I like to avoid the, weird, the word rendering or um, presentation, but there's some layout definition with the data that you get back from XM Cloud and the CM instance. But we will be offering both uh, with under the umbrella of our SaaS product offerings with XM Cloud. And the subscriptions would be different. So you're subscribing and getting entitlements to either <clears throat> XM and your content management with XM, or you're getting entitlements with your headless CMS system. You could also have both uh, if you if you have needs for both. Huh. So it would actually just so there would be an option to get XM, XM CS, XM Cloud, and the headless CMS, and that's the experience uh, that we would get. It would be part of the launchpad, or is this temporary? Good question. We're talking about where's the best fit for this. In fact, this morning I, I had a conversation about, about this very topic and the engineer and architect that I spoke to said we might be moving this button, so, so unsure yet. Um, what we want to have happen is for wherever you're storing and modeling your content, for it to be available to you in your pages experience, in your component building experience, in your site experience for content authors. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so is okay. the headless CMS um, like a different license or is it included as part of XM Cloud? I believe it's going to be a separate uh, entitlement or subscription. Uh, we're trying to get away from the traditional licensing in a way. Um, so a little bit unsure. I don't know, Andy, if you have any other details, but from what I from what I understand, I have, they're going to be separate, separate purchases. Yeah, I have no details on that. I think it all should be free. <laughs> <laughs> At least a free we're version. Just, we're just funded by venture capitalists and stuff. <laughs> you guys um, um, question over here. Hey, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, go for some reason, I had an understanding that to, to go with XM Cloud, you must be using the headless, but doesn't look like that is a case uh, It's since it says coming soon. So first of all, is that no, understanding? Uh, yeah, so the, the headless, sorry, I cut you off there. Um, the headless CMS is, is pure headless in, in that there is no layout um, with XM Cloud, the XM flavor of it, you still mm. would be using SXA headless, or you could optionally use JSS um, SDK uh, without headless SXA. But th the difference is that with Sitecore XM, you get layout um, in addition to content to build up a page structure, and you get all the tools around site building and pages, whereas a headless CMS it's not, uh, there won't be like an SDK, uh, I don't think. Um, it, it's, it, you model it yourself. You don't have to, there's no, there's no layout model, right? You're, you start out with nothing and you, you build it exactly the way you want. It's very, it's a very popular way of working for front end developers who want to get up and running very, very quickly with that's completely technology agnostic. Whereas uh, XM, uh, headless, SXA, JSS, those are all opinionated frameworks that uh, suggest that you use Next.js with React, things like that. Um, you don't have to, you could totally use the, the layout service for that, that you get in XM Cloud and you don't even have to use uh, the layout service, you could just use the item service. You could build pure headless 
um, using Cycor XM as well. Um, but it's just that the headless CMS product is it's it's completely separate, simplified, um, just meant to get up and running very very quickly. I will add answer, everything. Yeah, Everything that will be deployed and hosted in XM Cloud will be based on a headless technology stack or a headless architecture. And that means no more content delivery servers. Everything gets published to Edge. Uh, you're responsible as a customer or implementation partner to host your front end website and application yourself using your technology vendor of choice or your rendering host uh, provider of choice. Um, there will be no support for MVC doing that. We don't want live traffic and web requests coming directly to our content management server to do rendering and to do serving of live pages. That should all be retrieving of content from Edge and then rendering on a rendering host that's hosted somewhere else. So that's why we say everything in XM Cloud would be headless. Although there's a couple of different flavors of headless as you've heard from both of us. That's good, thank you. Is, is there going to be some sort of linkage between this headless CMS and the content or so? instead of uh, pulling content directly or typing in the content editor screen, just directly pulling it from the headless CMS space, uh, whatever the structure there may be. So as I understand it, there this new component builder, um, which it says components right there under the build um, row, will allow you to create components in HTML snippets and templates for, for content where you can pull in data sources from any location, whether it's, I don't know, Salesforce, whether it's XM, whether it's headless CMS, content, contentful, whatever you want, or just some raw JSON data structures, then you'll be able to drop that component into, a, into XM pages. And then there you have the link, kind of a loosely coupled link to whatever data provider you want. Um, or you could take that HTML snippet and drop it in React somehow. I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen uh, how they're doing that yet, um, but I believe that's, that's how it's intended to work. Justin, do you have any more feedback on that? Yeah, you got it, Andy. Uh, essentially, you would do it through our component building tool that's gonna be coming soon. And then think of it as like data sourcing. So I'm getting my data source from headless CMS or I'm getting my data source from XM or I'm getting my data source from some other location. Makes sense, makes sense. Which uh, data sources do you guys plan to support at the release? One I can't answer. I'm not sure what the initial ones will be. I know it's um, talked about a lot. Um, obviously it will be available for headless CMS and XM. Beyond those two, I, I'm not sure. The, the slide where that they're showing at, we showed at Subcons, both a, uh, Australia and Europe and uh, various uh, internal presentations. I mean, all that's public. Let me see what it is uh, on, this, uh, on, the, on the designs, um, which isn't set in stone. Let me just look at this real quick. XSM Cloud, Subcon. Yeah, recall Contentful is on it. Oh, oh yeah, so. Yeah, I've is... seen the team who's working on the component builder tool um, use like mock data and just provide it with like uh, a JSON data source or something for like, you know, mock data population and testing. I think on the slide where, yeah, Contentful is on there. But uh, again, I don't know how soon those connectors will be planned or where they are on the roadmap. Yeah, so it says like choose data source and it says content, which is XM, contentful, Con content with a K, sample API of five products, and then connect a new data source. So assuming you could connect from anywhere, maybe there's some out of the box ones and we'll probably add more providers over time. But again, this is what, what Justin and I have seen. Justin sees more than me, but this is this is a PowerPoint slide that I've that I've seen. So this is probably planned and it's subject to change. What about the other side of the product like Content Hub uh, connection from there? I don't see why not. I mean that, that would make sense to yeah. allow that. For XM in uh, XM Cloud, we will be providing a Content Hub CMP connector, so you'll be able to use that if you're a Content Hub uh, subscriber. 
CMP or DAM. Yep. 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 Would we be able to customize that connector, or is that oh, is that going to be a black box? Well, you can customize. I mean, the way that we're adding the connector, it's basically it's patched in, right? It's patched into our base image. So as long as you can add config files and upload your own code, which you absolutely can do, you could patch and modify anything you want. You could turn it off. You could patch something else in. You know, override a, uh, a pipeline processor, whatever you want. Sitecore is still fully extensible as long as you're overriding the right pipelines, right? So you wouldn't want to override a request pipeline because there is no request pipeline with XM Cloud. Um, you'd want to do it some kind of pre-rendering or I'm sorry, rendering pipeline that that happens before it gets published. Um, yeah. Andy, is that a long-term vision? The ability to like patch in and upload your own backend code is that a long-term vision, or is Webhooks going to play a role? So that's a great question. Um, this is what I think is going to happen. I think that, well, I, I guess before I tell you what I think is going to happen, the reason why we we added custom customization support, we didn't want to alienate developers in the way that they're used to developing, right? We needed to provide the same kind of ability for you guys to customize that you were used to, same kind of development practices that you're used to using container development. Um, so we didn't want to take everything away all at once. Same at with supporting your existing solutions into XM Cloud. We want to make it so that it's easier to take your existing implementations and, and make them move uh, to XM Cloud. Yep. Sorry, Andy, we I also, cut you off. No, no problem. We also, yes, we have a webhook framework that's built into XM Cloud, which will also be available in Sitecore 10.3 and beyond. Um, and we expect people to use webhooks. And I mean, Edge also has its own webhooks. You could also add webhooks on the GitHub side of things or your, you know, your source control. You could add webhooks on the Vercel side or whatever rendering technology you're using. But um, what I would expect to happen over time is that people will customize XM less and less and less. And uh, you, th th there just won't be a need to do that anymore. That's what I would expect to happen. I, I would see most of the customizations happening on data um, ETL uh, or uh, you know data ingestion um, synchronizing data from external sources, bringing it into XM before it gets published. Uh, it, yeah, so it's just data synchronization stuff. Like the common integration that we would do at Horizontal is uh, a, a PR Newswire uh, list. Like we need to get data from PR Newswire. How do you get it in, into Sitecore so then it gets published out? I, I could see that kind of custom integration happening a lot. Um, but Or customizing the UI. Like you could still customize the CM if you want. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, 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 with this whole composable and headless technology set, I, a, a lot of the customizations move either to the edge um, or just to your front end code directly. So uh, for someone who may be migrating from the traditional PaaS solution, uh, the monolithic architecture to the cloud solution, would it make sense to wait for the headless CMS release or migrate now? Depends on what you need. Right. Um, it, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I would say you'd want to buy the right tool for the right job. Right. It, yeah. it, 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 the answer is it really just depends. And that's it's not a cop out answer. It's a real answer. Right. It really depends as technologists what what we what we want to use for for what job. So I don't really know. And, enough I, and about I'll it. go ahead. And I'll add, um, if XM Cloud is on your roadmap, like you have uh, aspirations to go to a SaaS technology platform, the great thing about XM Cloud is all the headless SDKs and development tools, they're available in 10.2 today. So you can start building on this architecture and get ready for a solution today without XM Cloud. Uh, you can use Edge, you can use our uh, headless JSS SDKs. Uh, and you can start transforming your solution to get ready for SaaS if that's if that's your plan. Yeah, that's Andy. I, I've got another question. Uh, I can't help but stare at that work box. Uh, have there been any improvements in the workflow engine, or any kind of improvements in Sitecore's workflow, or is that okay. the uh, is that the original okay. work box from like six point one? <laughs> Looks like it. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> is there any workflow in Pages, Justin? I really don't know. Is there any? I think that there I is actually that. in Pages. Uh, there, yes, there, there is. Be. There is some kind of. There is approvals in Pages, but uh, I don't think there is a work box, if I remember correctly. Okay. Right. Definitely yeah, not a work box there. directly in Pages, yeah. but. Um, yeah. There is the approval. You can approve and you can actually do the language version as well in Pages. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, we have not improved that. Um, <laughs> yeah, they need to at least make that box bigger. Uh, I remember scrolling, like like all the workflows show up there and you got to keep scrolling in that list. Yeah, all uh, experience. That, that work box, me and, me and that work box have a, uh, we have a history. Mm -hmm. Similar question on experience editor. How long is this guy sticking around for? Um, well, Pages is actually powered by the experience editor still behind the scenes. We are doing some improvements that is going to go directly. Justin, can I socialize this? I don't know. What, what are you about to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me say this. We are focusing on the performance of Pages right now. and. Um, Basically, I believe they're going to go straight into APIs instead of, uh, well, no, it'll still work with Experience Editor, but they're going to not do page refreshes and modify the DOM directly. I don't know how they're going to do it, but so they'll probably still need Experience Editor behind the scenes. Whether or not people would want to use Experience Editor, I don't know. Um, one of the neat things about SAS is uh, we should have the ability to see what people are actually using. What are the tools? What are the, what are the customizations that you're making? What are the what are you using Experience Editor? Are you using Pages? Are you using the new Explorer? Are you you know like what are the things that people are using, and um, we'll be able to adapt over time. And we can push updates out to this thing you know multiple times a day, a second if we wanted to, if we had that many developers. But uh, we're, we're we have rapid rapid changes um, coming. Awesome. Let's do uh, maybe a couple more questions and uh, I will get into the sessions. Oh. All right, I have one question. Um, put you guys on the spot a little bit. Can you share something with us that hasn't been shared yet? in the other events or other sources about what we can expect from XM Club? Well, I'll start by saying, I think you've seen the, a shift in the amount of information that we're sharing. Um, a lot of our pro product roadmaps have been discussed at uh, user groups and symposium type sessions and subcons. Um, I think a lot of it is out in the community um, being somewhat talked about already. Are there new things that we're working on? Yes, there's a few things that we can't share yet. Um, I will say the engineering and architecture team, we're excited about a couple of things that uh, we have ideas for and we're super excited, which I think is a good sign, but um, it's not something that we can socialize yet. And I'll say it's focused on developer experience and user experience, uh, making this whole thing easier to use and navigate for all different audience types. Yep, that's, yeah, that's, that's a big focus that Justin and I have is how do you get developers and marketers working with this stuff really, really fast? That's, that's our whole goal here. We started with the deploy experience. Now we're moving uh, even more and more into the developer experience, what that looks like. And um, I think that I think that you guys are going to be super excited about what's coming as soon as we can announce it. Vasily, I actually have one more question kind of in that okay. vein. So, so in that vein, um, are there any plans for like developer trials or if I'm a starving artist, how do I, what's the best way for me to kind of get in there and start playing with it? Um, I would, so you're from search stacks, right, Pete? Yeah. And I don't, not necessarily, I mean, I know we're having other conversations, but it wasn't necessarily a search stack cleaning question. I was just from a, from a community perspective, if, if I'm just a general developer and maybe not even an MVP, right? Like 
how how do I is is working with the containers and and the endpoint to the best way to really learn this, or is there a way to to is there a developer trial license coming on the pipe that maybe we can look forward to? Got it. Yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, if you're a partner, my recommendation is to reach out to your um, partner enablement team, and they're working on a priority list of who's getting access. Um, and it's a it's a pretty long list, and it takes us a while to process all the requests and get through the org provisioning. Also, there's a fair amount of cost that uh, we're spending on just hosting these environments, and we're trying to decide what kind of limits to put on um, partners that we're giving access to. Um, Beyond that, I have seen developers out on the Sitecore Slack channel and community who haven't gotten access to XM Cloud yet, and they have just gone to our portal.sitecorecloud.io um, website and um, signed themselves up with an account. That account doesn't, it's not backed by a subscription, so you can't do much with it. But once they have that, then they've gone out to our Sitecore Labs GitHub account and downloaded our uh, reference code repositories. And then you can essentially run XM Cloud locally. It's not SaaS, it's, it's not running in our cloud and you miss out on some of the things that you showed today. So for example, locally, you're not gonna be running portal. Locally, you're not gonna be running pages. Locally, you're not gonna be running that dashboard and see the site adding experience, um, but you can see the CMS and the rendering host locally um, if, if you're really itching to get your hands on something. And yeah, that's, you that's could also, we, sorry, Andy, go ahead. You could, yeah, you could also go to github.com slash sitecore slash xm hyphen cloud hyphen introduction. And that has uh, the MVP sites, the subcon sites uh, with various different technologies like the .NET uh, rendering SDK, JSS, and headless XSA implementations on XM Cloud. Um, you could download that. And like Justin said, you could, you could play around. Um, locally yeah, great, only. great, great. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, I was going to add to that. I've created actually a video that goes through how to do that uh, step by step, how to download the XM Cloud intro and how do you uh, hook it up to Portal Cloud so that you can do this whole thing. I'll just send it on the chat right now. Yeah, by the way, Mo, Mo created a series of videos, some yeah. videos around XM some for XM Cloud and some for CDP. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all righty. Well, uh, Andy. Uh, Justin, thank you guys so much for joining. Great questions, great um, great answers. Uh, pleasure having you guys. Thanks a lot again for um, answering the questions and supporting the community. Um, at this point, um, you guys can go ahead and drop if you'd like or stick around for the sessions. Uh, we're going to switch over to Ketan. Uh, he's going to talk to us about content modeling and content hub. And so without further ado, Ketan, take it away. Yes. Uh, okay. All right, can you see my screen? Yep. All right. All right. So, um, hello, everyone. Good day. Um, I'll start with a little bit of introduction about myself. So, I started my site core journey with site core commerce uh, in, in a particular project, and then XPXM uh, project, and now Content Hub, even dabbling a little bit with site core personalized. For the past couple of months, um, we at iCreon have been ideating more and more around Font Hub platform um, and various use cases that it can fulfill. And there are a lot of use cases that it can do, uh, can fulfill. Um, I'm um, mostly available on Slack in case someone wants to connect after the session. Uh, as a note. Um, for this particular presentation, I want to share my learnings around Font Hub modeling and the need for it in today's world. Um, it is necessary, I think, to ask and answer questions before we start discussing uh, the general framework for creating quantum models. So uh, we'll start with uh, defining what exactly a quantum model is, and then looking at two different types of frameworks that we have been uh, thinking and ideating about. Uh, to start with, what exactly is a quantum model, right? Um, the, the definition that you would find on the web is like, it's, it's a uh, document, it's a, it's a structure uh, which can host various different kinds of content, various different types of content. So you just not, um, and, and that is not just to be hosted for the website, but for any other channel as well, be it email, be it mobile, can be anything. Uh, the two content models that we'll be going through today, um, 
is product focused. This is generally centered around uh, any e-commerce content. And the second one is more on channel focus. So this is more suitable for content management for a business with multiple channels, multiple, um, you can say, uh, engagement, uh, customer engagement channels. Um, to start with, let's ask the question, why do we even need the framework? Frameworks like exist everywhere from technology to development to content. Um, there's like a wide variety of frameworks that exist out in the world. So um, let's add two more to the mix. Uh, in order to decide or choose what the right framework is for the right job, for the right scenario, it is necessary to ask some of the questions. So the questions uh, listed out over here is about thinking about the creators, thinking about the authors and how they are interacting with the model, not just the end user who may be consuming all of that content. Um, how the new content is going to be introduced for what use cases and scenarios. So gathering as much scenarios as possible uh, upfront uh, helps us build like a robust uh, future-proof content model that can scale as content needs changes for any business, which is changing rapidly, especially in these scenarios in these times. Um, most importantly, does the model simplify the overall content operations? Or is it just an overhead to build um, and utilize this particular content model in the way it is desired to be? Um, so to start off with, the first one is the product-focused content modeling framework, which aims to provide implementation tools and business analysts a standard method for defining, structuring, and using content models within a Content Hub implementation. Uh, here, the focus is on product. Um, this framework is suitable for brands or organizations adapting uh, Content Hub primarily for its uh, PIM capabilities. Um, and it, it has four tiers or layers as far as the framework is concerned that one needs to go through in order to build the final content model. Right? Uh, to start with the first layer, this is the, like the foundation layer. Since everything is center product, we start with the product. Uh, one of the things that we see is like in e-commerce platforms or in any other um, commerce tools for applications, there are a wide variety of options to create uh, product bundles, product variants, catalogs, having recommendations, there are product types, relationships. So we need to structure it so that the content can also be in a similar kind of fashion and uh, can fulfill all of those needs when it comes to any uh, product related content. Right. Um, so thinking about creating product variants, um, bundles, and uh, similar products within the uh, Content Hub ecosystem uh, helps us build that initial uh, framework or, or the uh, layer uh, for this. And over here, I just had a screenshot to showcase like how we uh, thought about this. Uh, so in Content Hub, we have this uh, option to enable linkages with other products uh, as a child, or maybe create bundles. Uh, for a particular product that can contain multiple separate products as well. And these can then be utilized in the, uh, maybe in the rendering or the presentation or can even connect to uh, content, which is the second layer. So the next layer is mapping product to content. So when we talk about uh, product related content or like commerce content, what does it look like? What does it entail? So a good example to look at is, let's say the Amazon website. So there's a lot of content around products. If you open a product detail page, there's like uh, product features, specifications, FAQs, product promotions, blogs, even emails, videos, it's like endless. So the content essentially is mapped to each other um, as well as it's mapped to uh, product as well. Um, one of the things that we learned is like, the lesser the number of direct linkages are there, uh, the easier it is to maintain in the long term. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, however, there can be multiple, uh, you can say, variants or bundles of a product which can increase the complexity. So it is generally good to dissociate any information uh, to content layer for um, reusability. So if we are thinking about um, a description pro for a product, uh, instead of mapping it at a product variant level, why not map it at a product level? Because it's generally going to be the same for any variant. The only changes are maybe the color or the size or things like that. Um, over here, we just uh, listed out like how we structured uh, content uh, types, uh, think about features, specifications, and these are all then related or mapped to a particular uh, product. Um, the third layer over here is around assets. So we need a lot of imagery, videos, um, any documents, PDFs uh, that would help us um, 
contextualize what product we are looking at in the presentation layer or otherwise, uh, be it any channel. Uh, when we started listing out what kind of media files there can exist uh, associated um, with a particular product, we found there are like product guides, manuals, images, there are graphs and charts that talk about the product, uh, a lot of artworks and imagery around it, uh, media um, that can be part of a content or even independent as well. So in some cases, uh, the images and everything uh, are imbibed into the content or there are some textual refer references or fragments um, that are part of the image itself. Uh, in other scenarios, it's just a plain simple image uh, and that can link to both uh, product and content. So over here in this slide, you can see the center section. Um, there is the product specification, so that that is uh, linked to the content side, and this is this is just a simple um, asset image, as well as it's also related to the product. Now establishing these linkages enabled us to uh, uh, like um, grab this particular information uh, via APIs as well. Uh, this helped us uh, capture all of the relevant information directly from one single source, as opposed to picking it up from multiple uh, spaces. Um, the last uh, layer is uh, optional. We, we treat this as optional, but uh, this is more around any sort of product tutorials, demos, articles that live outside of the um, content hub space, so to speak. So anything that lives out, let's say, in YouTube, sure, it originated maybe from um, the asset space within content hub, but in the end, right now, it is live and um, visible on YouTube as, as a video, as a demo or a tutorial, or even let's say a blog, which is a content content hub, but uh, published on a website or any other channel as such. Uh, so there are linkages that can be established to uh, these external uh, content pieces as well. Uh, this provides us some sort of a sense or information to where our content is living as of now, as opposed to just seeing the content in the uh, in, in the, you can say, uh, a headless space. Um, everything, anything should map back to the product. That's the whole central idea of this uh, framework uh, to provide a holistic view of various content types that exist out there in the world um, related to uh, the product. Um, over here, uh, there can be various channels as well where we would want to put out this particular content uh, centered around product, be it web, be it social blogs or articles. Uh, and that's the whole um, idea around uh, mapping it to any particular channel. So over here, when we created content, uh, there's this field which talks about channels and then mapping it to a particular channel. So the content may be laying out in one or many different channels and just providing that contextual information also helps content editors to update or create in that contextual sense and not just uh, updating it uh, solely looking at the content itself. The next model over here is uh, a channel focused content modeling framework. So this focuses around um, the wide variety of channels that would exist for any brand or organization. This model is perfect for reuse. So if there is a uh, lot of operational overhead in terms of creating content for, let's say, social media, creating for Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, multiple times storing it like multiple variations, this uh, breaks through all of that and thinks of um, creating one single source for anything that uh, may be put out in the world in, in various different channels. Uh, over here, the mindset needs to change a little bit for anyone who is creating the content as well, because it's more like, um, like breaking the old habit of uh, Visivic editors and thinking about it in a, in a more headless manner, just content, you don't see what is being presented over there. Um, and then building a pipeline for content creation. So thinking it of it as, as a uh, pipeline, as opposed to like one stop shop of creating like an entire page or something. Uh, this framework is again a four step process uh, that help us define the final content framework. Uh, to start with, the first one talks about creating an inventory. At this step, in this particular stage, um, what one could expect is to talk to various uh, channel owners. So generally in businesses, the teams may or may not be structured in such a manner that one person is responsible for web, one may be responsible for social, one may be for blogs. Uh, there could be dep different departments or uh, business functions that are publishing content in various different channels. 
Um, so over here, there could also be various external vendors that are involved, which may be uh, helping the business in terms of pushing content to web or uh, commerce or even emails, um, various different tools as well. So a lot of stakeholder communication goes over here um, in terms of um, defining and creating a holistic list of inventory uh, as to what kind of content currently exists in various channels. So um, and what is best about content hub is that this list we we started creating this in excel and it just translates automatically into you can say uh, a list of um, inventory uh, listing out all of the different channels where the content lies currently and this uh, provides us the one single source for any channel that could exist um, uh, for the content to push out uh, in the next uh, phase uh, as well as the step uh, we wanted to dissociate uh, any of the promotion content any of the uh, that may lie in website uh, or commerce or even email uh, so over here once we dissociated it we combined that all together into one centralized you can say content piece so uh, in some cases if the promotion is on a website uh, we have three different fields four different fields different kinds of information on email uh, there is the same context, but different types of uh, language or usage uh, over there. Uh, in e-commerce context, it shifts a little bit. Uh, what we did over here is um, create one single source for any promotional content or any campaign or any uh, product-related content. Right? Uh, similar content um, is great for modeling. So uh, we found out like some of the content pieces, such as product information. It's uniform across all the channels. There was very little variation. Whereas when it comes to uh, campaigns, there was a lot of variation. So it's a little bit tricky to combine it all together and create a one single uniform template or a structure for it. Um, over here, uh, once we create this, the best benefit over here is it reduces the time and effort in creating um, a uniform structure that works for every single channel at a later point of time. Uh, also, it uh, helps us gain an overall picture of the content and what all information is required at uh, this particular stage of uh, content modeling. Uh, in the next iteration, what we do is create this as one single entity within Content Hub instead of separate entities for various different channels. Uh, so as an example, content promotion contains a title, a promo text, and a bunch of tags. It's, it's a simplified version in actually it may be a little bit more complex but these are the three most important things that exist and is common across all the channels that help us guide and create these content types uh, within content hub once this is built the next step is to create content relationships so how different pieces of content are interacting with each other maybe um, a promotion piece or, or a copy or even a document so we may be promoting a document uh, or maybe a product is being promoted. Uh, there is a video that talks about a product. So um, even if they are like audiences for a particular campaign, all of these relationships, uh, once we visualize, once we map, uh, it can be quite daunting, um, frankly to speak, uh, uh, because there are a lot of linkages and relationships that one can expect. Um, the centered part around over here is like to name all of these relationships to understand the why uh, behind these relationships and provide a contextual linkage between uh, any two entities. Um, the idea over here is to add as limited relationships as possible, not just being connected everything to everything. Uh, the limited number of connections uh, help um, developers as well as content creators to maintain um, the uh, system in a, in a longer term, uh, maintain Content Hub in a longer term. Uh, real world relationships only would be the ones that we should be thinking about if there is any relationship in terms of um, uh, taxonomical reference or if there is something that we just want to keep for the system sake. Uh, I would say like not to uh, create those relationships and thus keep them uh, as close as possible to the real world scenarios and uh, does this thing actually um, relates or connects to another uh, type of content. Uh, the next uh, part over here is around mapping this content back to the channel. So we started with the channels and various content around it. 
created one single uniform content structure for each content type. And now we need to send it back to different channels. At this stage, all the new content structure that is being created is now being mapped to individual channels. This is uh, where we are sending all of the information in a uniform structure to various channels. This might require at this particular stage um, a, some or maybe a lot of rework in some of these channels as well, because these channels have a set way of consuming the content. If the content modeling in the initial stages is good enough, then there is very minimal work to be done towards the later end when we finally uh, federate this content to various particular uh, channels. And um, this is the entirety of uh, this particular framework, which uh, is the fourth step. And then uh, the establishing linkages, maybe one to one, maybe many to many uh, between content and uh, different channels where it will live and thrive. Um, I just want to share some screens as well uh, in terms of how the configuration would look like. So this is something that we saw on the product side as well. Uh, product to product linkage. Uh, there is product to content link linkage. Uh, this helps us define product bundles, variants, catalogs, uh, different types of products, the relationships as such. Um, and then there are content configurations. Uh, so linking asset to product, um, uh, linking uh, maybe a uh, channel or a taxonomy chan uh, channel taxonomy to content and defining the entire taxonomy in one single source. So we don't have to uh, refer it in multiple sources. Uh, this is the entirety of our learning and uh, happy to share with you. And um, yeah, uh, if there are any questions, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. I have a question, Kitan. Um, yeah. What about content operation? So I understand now that you have the different media, and as you said, there might be someone managing, let's say, social that's different than whoever is managing blog. And in most cases, let's say you're creating the article, uh, your blog post, for instance, and then you're going to advertise it or promote it in social. So how do you manage the workflow between these and that content operation piece of it? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so what what we saw. Uh, so, this is like an example from what we implemented recently in one of the projects. Is like uh, previously the mindset is like uh, there are seventy different files stored in one drive, right? And then you just pull content from there, pick up a Word file, start creating your content, send that Word document maybe to a developer or someone on the marketing team who is going to push put that on the web in, in a structured format, um, be it WordPress or any other site. Uh, what the mindset change had to be done over here is all of these assets need to be owned by one single person. The content is being created by another, and then there is no need for anyone else to publish it. The content editors or the asset creators have the authority to change it and publish it um, on, on the websites or other channels as well directly. So this streamlined their entire workflow and reduced the dependency as well. So the content creators can start creating content without the need of asset, even if they need it, or maybe the asset team or uh, the people who are creating these images in Adobe InDesign or anything, they can work on their own schedule, irrespective of what the content is, team is doing. Right. So this streamlined their processes and reduced a lot of dependency that exists um, as a whole. Yeah. What are, uh, Ketan, what are some of the challenges, or if any, that you guys ran into with atomic content modeling? Or what are the oh. biggest takeaways? Yeah, I, th I think the biggest challenge was changing the mindset from um, the busy big editor. So everyone wants to see what is going to be the final presentation, but overhead it's like, you, you just have fields, you have a title, description, some related tags, and that's it. The, the actual person who is creating that has no idea how it's going to be presented in, in the final uh, rendering or in how it's going to be presented in an email or, or a social media channel. Uh, they just hit the button and it goes out there. So what we uh, try to do over here is establish a workflow. The workflow enables um, the final author um, to push it out into the web. So we started with various environments. So configuring that on a staging maybe where they can actually see it and then finally pushing it out to the live environment. That makes sense. That makes sense. That actually goes back to, to that question of headless CMS versus XM. Exactly. So yeah. in this, you're, you know, you're working with omni, omni channel content, there's no presentation versus XM is the WYSIWYG. Yeah. 
All right, any other questions for Ketan? All right, great presentation, Ketan. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank I, I think you. the modeling is the biggest, biggest thing that's gonna make or break the content of implementation. If you, um, if you have your model flexible enough, robust enough, uh, the implementation will last for a long time. And uh, otherwise, you're gonna make your content author's job miserable moving forward. <laughs> and it's gonna be expensive to maintain that moving forward. Yeah. So can, uh, great tips. Thanks a lot again. So next one, uh, next session we have Mo. And Mo is going to talk to us about using Sitecore CDP and Sitecore Personalize in an unorthodox way, something that we haven't heard Sitecore speak about yet, but I think it's a great use case. Um, the employee experience, the space is blowing up. Like I was saying earlier, we're even, we're, we're moving into the space. So uh, lots of exciting things happening, especially with uh, Gartner's movement towards total experience, um, where, where we're now uh, starting to think about connecting the edge experience, so the, the, the public experience with internal employee experience, connecting the two so both are in complete sync. I think these things are going to be more and more important. So, well, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vasily, for mentioning that, because one, one thing I really uh, like about today's sessions, actually, is the way they went from XM Cloud into content modeling and then into employee experience, because uh, employee experience in general is very unique, and it's been a great experience. So let me first introduce myself before I jump into getting all excited about employee experience. Uh, I'm Mo Sharif. I'm the VP of Product Strategy for Duzen. Duzen is an employee experience platform built on top of Sitecore. So we kind of went the unorthodox way versus most other uh, Sitecore partners. Instead of building uh, websites and content customer experiences, we decided to use Sitecore for employee experiences. Doing so gave us a lot of interesting, I would say, experiences that are unique to employee experience. And that's why I'm saying the whole session today is really very interesting in the way we think about it. Because when you think about marketers in general and um, the marketing experience, they usually have their digital agency supporting them and so on. Whereas corporate comms are not as lucky. They don't usually have the same budgets. They don't usually have the same power that uh, content, uh, that marketing teams have. But at the same time, they want to do more. And right now there is so much need for them to be able to do more with the hybrid work. So how do we help them do that with things like uh, the ability to create WYSIWYG, but also the ability to manage content across the board. So how do they create blogs that are internal and then that are sent on social, for instance, and this whole ecosystem or this whole journey, how do we work it together? And one thing we're doing now is moving our platform to XM Cloud and combining content modeling from headless CMS with uh, XM Cloud and the WYSIWYG experience. So that combination also works really well. So it's great to see first the demo of XM Cloud and then go into content modeling and then go into employee experience. But today I'm gonna actually be talking a little bit more about CDP. So Sitecore CDP uh, is the customer data platform for us. It's actually employee data platform. So again, as we are moving uh, our product from XP and using the Sitecore personalization into Sitecore CDP and Sitecore XM Cloud. Um, one thing we wanted to do is again, leverage CDP and the capabilities of CDP in our unique scenario. So I'm sure everyone's seen this probably before, but this is really how Sitecore CDP works. You have your CDP, you have your experimentation, your decision engine for personalization, of course, and the experiences you can create. That's kind of the centerpiece. And then you have different types of ways to ingest data about your employee. So you have your batch customer profile. So this is where you're getting data from uh, warehouses, data lakes, and so on. You have, and this is usually something that happens on a nightly basis, for instance. You have your interactive data that is more operational from operational systems. And you have, of course, your stream data, which is any interactions that are happening on the fly right away right now, uh, for example, on your web application or your mobile app. 
So if we think about employee experience, we actually utilize most of these. So think about an employee experience. As soon as an employee logs in, they're expecting a personalized experience from the get-go because they do. it's not like a customer experience where you're an anonymous first. That person is already sing, signed on. They've you have a lot of information about them. So they have that expectation that you're going to personalize the content based on what department they're working for, which country they're in. So all these different personalization scenarios become a de facto in our experience. And to do that, we've utilized the batch uh, APIs to connect to Workday and to connect to Azure Active Directory to be able to collect that data about the employee and build our employee data profile on from the get-go on a daily basis, we have that batch running and collecting that information. The interactive data is also really important. Think of things like learning. And when you're integrating with your learning management system, we want to be able to, when you complete a learning, we want to remove it from your task list. When you get a new learning or a new task, we want to be able to add it to your task list directly. So this is where that interactive uh, capability comes into play. And of course, all your views, your searches, and all your interactions within the web are things that we also want to handle as part of the interaction. So things like uh, the views, the campaigns you've initiated, or journeys you've started, identifying you, of course. Uh, as I was saying, new learning, if you've completed a learning, uh, new journeys, like uh, if you started a journey on Workday, and of course, all your customer information from HR system. These are things we we integrated within CDP and the experience was actually really, really smooth compared to Cycor XP. So that was really nice. And then you have our decisioning and our AI model. We use auto segmentation here. And that is one of the things that we're, we've seen a lot of value in combining the office graph. So everything that Microsoft knows about each employee with Sitecore's interactions into one. So we're able to deduce what you want to do, not just and recommend to you personalization scenarios, not just because of what you've been doing on the website, but also based on the Microsoft graph, which brings all your interactions, how you're using documents, how you're using Office, PowerPoint, Word, all that into one place. So I'll stop talking for a while, uh, just so I can start demoing. Um, so first, are there any questions before I start demoing anything? Okay, so let's get started. So let me just go into CDP and I need to log in again because it's expired. Okay. I'm gonna actually start by going through how do we get started with this. So I have this very simple HTML page that I'm gonna walk through and explain what I'm doing in it. And then from that, I'm gonna actually uh, move forward to uh, showing things in action. So again, as I was saying, the whole idea here is, uh, and maybe I just need to play that, uh, just to show you what's going to happen as well. So it's on localhost 00. zero. Oops. Okay. So as soon as I go to that page, it's a very simplistic page. It doesn't really have anything in there. And I need to write actual HTML. It just has a sign-in button. And this is actually the Azure AD out of the box sign-in button from the Microsoft Graph Toolkit. So it doesn't do much really for now. What I'm going to do is just go with one of my sample users, Megan here, and I'm going to actually click on that sign-in button. You'll see here, it's actually asking me to log in. So I'm going to log in with Megan. And of course, this is integrated with Azure AD. So it's going to log in hopefully. And of course we have to have a demo issue here. So now you can see that my sign-in button has changed into this login page with 
Megan's information. Again, this is completely out of the box Azure AD. And what's happening behind the scene is that this is actually collecting that information and pushing it to CDP. So if I go to CDP here and search for Megan, I'll see that my customer Megan has been identified. You'll see here it's a customer. So that means it has been identified and I can see all her interactions. I can also go into the information here to see all the information about her and when she last opened the site and um, as well as other information that we're going to see how to extend the data and how to add our own data, like for example, her job title, which is again coming from Azure AD. So let's get started and see all that in action and see how we actually created that very simple scenario. So the first thing, again, this page, as I was saying, is quite empty. It doesn't have a lot in there. It just has a few scripts. Uh, so the body has what we call the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Graph Toolkit MSAL provider. This is how we integrate with Azure AD. You just write your client ID here and it manages the authentication for you. And then we have uh, Microsoft Graph Toolkit login control. Again, this is a control that enables you to log in. But what we've done is uh, added just the login status here and added a script listener to the MGT login. And we added an event listener to the login completed. So as soon as Azure AD has identified the user has um, <clears throat> completed login, ultimately, we want to really do some other stuff with, um, uh, with Box Ever and with um, CDP. So what, we, what we're doing here is we're asking the Microsoft Graph Toolkit provider to provide us with the username for that user, which is our email info. Um, and then we're actually hitting the Microsoft Graph Toolkit to get the user themselves. So we're getting me, which is the currently logged in user. And then we're able to start hitting my fetching from Box Ever. Uh, that URL so that we can identify whether the user is currently a visitor or a guest. I'm going to explain why we're doing that in a minute, but we want to know if they are a visitor, then we need to identify them. So this is the first time they've actually logged in as a user uh, and have been identified after logging in. So uh, they're visitors, so we need to identify them. Else we need to, um, we know that they're a customer and we're going to do something else here for that. So if they are a visitor, what I'm doing is I'm pushing a box ever queue event, and that event is identity event. The identity event is used to identify a user. So it's usually it's used to convert a visitor into a customer, and we can add all the information we need about that person. So you'll see here I'm adding their first name, their last name, and their title, which is their job title. All these are being added, and of course their email. All these are being added from the response I got from the me um, request. So I already know a lot of information about that user. Now, if they are a customer, so if they're an existing customer, uh, we want to get their job title. Um, and uh, the reason I did it here, like in real case scenarios, of course, and in our product, we don't actually do it here because you don't want to hit every time the user logs in. You don't want to go and hit and add that information from Azure AD. So we're doing it through batch, but here just to show the capability, uh, what I've done here is I'm pushing to the guest profile ID. So I have my guest profile ID, which is the URL of guests slash the box ever the guest reference. And because I know they're a customer, so I already know that this is a real customer. So it has a guest slash guest ref. And then I'll create a new JSON object with a key default. And this is really important. The key should be default so that I can see it in my um, box ever or um, information here. And more importantly, anything would be shown here. But if it's not default, you can't personalize using it. You can't buy it out of the box, at least. You can't use it in your experiences and your segmentation and experience, which we'll see in a minute. So it's really important to keep the key as default and to keep the actual extension that we're adding the data extension name to be slash ext ext uh, again so that it becomes part of the default data that you can then segment through in your experience. 
So I just added the job title here from, again, my me or my response coming from Microsoft Graph Toolkit, and I'm adding it to the job title, and then I'm just posting that request with that JSON object to uh, Box Ever or to Cycle CDP. Okay, and then I have just one more script here, which is the Box Ever uh, script to actually identify the user. This is the settings for Box Ever, and of course, to push that view event uh, or that web view event so that I'm actually logging that the user is viewing the page as well. Okay. And I'm not going to go into details on what exactly you need to add in this settings, just because it's really well documented. Um, Sitecore and Box Ever team have done a great job in documenting all the information. Uh, and of course, uh, you can also watch the videos where I explain this in much more details. Any questions so far? Okay. So now that uh, yeah, we... sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, Mo, uh, one quick question. So uh, yeah. over here, when you talk about the customers in CDP, that 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 are actually employees, right? Is there a way to like change that terminology somewhere in CDP or no? So no, you can't change the word customer itself. Uh, so it is. It still says customers, but uh, the data itself, of course, you can change. So you can change all the data you're adding to them and the data extensions. I've just added one right now for demo purposes, which is the job title. But in our implementations, we have like 20 fields about the customer or about, sorry, the employee, like their department, their um, language, their location, and so on and so forth. All these are added and we're able to segment through them. But the name customer is, is part of it ultimately. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I'll go into batch segments here and I'll just create a sample segment. So segment, oops, if I can spell why job title. And because we used it as EXT, the name as EXT, we would be able to see it here in our customer. So in our customer, here it shows you all the fields that are available and including any field that has been added uh, into the system under that EXT, EXT and default keyword. Uh, it does show up here as well. Now we have to wait 24 hours for it to actually show, but um, I already have it previously created, so I can just go to shop title and uh, use that as my uh, query string here as well. And then I go into experiences, and then I can create my personalization experience. Uh, one interesting scenario I'll cover as well here, I'll just go and add a new experience. First. And of course you can see this is the partner uh, CDP accounts. So you'll see there is a lot of other things that have been added, but let's say for example, I wanna create a pop takeover. Um, I can of course edit the content for it. So watch that. If I can spell or or. And I'll add a title. And of course I can add, uh, like change the button and do all that stuff. I'm happy with that. I can then start targeting it um, in both uh, page targets, so which page I want it to show on. Uh, right now, I don't have except one page, so that's not really a big deal. And I can choose if I want to segment it uh, through my segmentation as I was showing uh, previously. So I can add uh, my segment that I've created. Um, I haven't really created it, but I have created one previously. So I can segment by that segment and you'll see that there are zero guests in that job title uh, right now. And 
That's really how you personalize. Now, personalization in employee experience is two folds or two types. There is personalization where you're personalizing a specific component, like what we're showing here, either a takeover or a specific region. But there's also personalization uh, in terms of what content each person sees, right? So uh, let's say, for example, if I want each person to see um, the articles coming from their specific department or that are tagged to their specific department. And that is not really what CDP uh, would provide on its own. So the way we do that is one of two ways, either through search. So we're searching while using CDP as our personalization rules to pass in a query to that. Or the second way is completely outside of CDP by actually going straight to search with a query uh, that's filtering ultimately by job title or by whatever personal information because it's now composable. So each part is working on its own. Uh, so we're using CDP for only the ones that have actual personalization, but search-driven personalization, we hit directly the search engine um, with the query parameters we need. However, we do log uh, into CDP uh, all these interactions because we want one single source of truth and we want to be able to really understand more about how um, employees are using it, how employees are interacting with uh, content that is personalized to them. And I'll leave, I think I have three minutes, so I'll leave them for questions, just in case anyone has any questions. Um, if not, I can probably answer some of my own questions. Have you guys uh, integrated or ha have you started looking into the total experience? integrating so synchronizing some of the some of the things that's like that happening internally with with um, the things that happen externally is there anything planned in Duzen on the roadmap for that yeah we we do have specifically for social so this is why I was asking about content operations because one of the things we've seen a lot is um, the idea of creating specific content internally that goes out externally afterwards. So um, for example, let's say you have an announcement your CEO has announced and then we want to announce it in social media and then maybe announce it uh, on the web and through blogs and so on. So that operational piece is something that is started in that employee experience and goes through that total experience. This is something we are working on right now. Um, the second piece I would say around that as well is, which is also really interesting is how employer branding is part of that corporate communication. However, it's meant to be external as well. So that social piece where you want to show off your internal events, your internal uh, meetups and so on and so forth is combined with the employee experience and the internet. So that's also where it's that it's not in only the internet, it becomes that total experience and becomes a larger picture, I would say. Definitely, definitely. There's there's some interesting things we're thinking about also on our side, for instance, decision modeling, like let's say product recommenders or you know, promotion recommendations. These are, these are the same decision models that let's say we can use uh, for full stack experience, you know, for mobile, let's say on the website, but also for customer service, right? Someone, someone calls in a customer service using their, um, the CRM, you know, for instance, we create a custom component there that calls out to the full, um, full stack experience, same, similar, so same, same thing for a promotion, right? So the same thing that connected experience on the web, same promotion that they see on the web, the same promotion that they're reminded about, or let's say pitched you know, by customer service or even retention, um, yeah. You know, for instance, the, the, there are a lot of a lot of use cases that we see in the commerce space, like re retaining customers, right? Creating a decision model that looks at multiple data sources internally, that again also provides a recommendation for what to offer, uh, yeah. you know, a customer. Yeah, and that's one of the interesting things about CDP and really that data, uh, that stream of data that we can analyze. And this is something we're working, we've started working on, we haven't really reached somewhere yet. And there is a few videos I'm planning to do on is how do we get that data, that stream of data and how do we start creating analytics around it? 
uh, one thing that we're seeing more and more from our customers is the idea of office of the future, which is usually led by the CIO, where it's the CIO is now demanding to understand more about how employees are engaged. And it's no longer what, like, we've heard it so many times when we're going into sales meetings where, oh, SharePoint just shows us fake views. And by fake, what they're ultimately saying is, uh, customers have realized that organizations, your default browser just opens to the internet. So you have so many views by default. That does not necessarily mean that your internet is successful. However, SharePoint doesn't show you bounce rates. It doesn't show you anything else to show how relevant that experience was. However, with the hybrid workplace and the um, future of work and office of the future, whatever each company wants to call it, it becomes an essential part of measuring how successful that hybrid work is from a productivity perspective. And that's kind of on the CIO or from an employee engagement uh, perspective that's more on the HR side or from uh, organizational updates perspective that's more on marketing and corporate side. And how do you measure how successful these campaigns are uh, and have like this single unified dashboard? This is something that we're seeing so much excitement about in the employee experience space right now. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I, I think COVID, that whole the, the pandemic just just propelled it yeah. forward. You know, a lot of a lot of brands or companies are working remotely right now. So it's, it's a, the same story, not not only for you know the customer facing, but also again like employee retention, internal yeah. issue resolution, you know, all these things, the internal like employee experience now went from face to face to digital. So we're now starting to see the same types of questions that we Seen on on the public websites, well, user experience, customer experience, same things are now coming in internally. Now companies are looking for for a way to provide that natural employee experience because all they see is the internet, right? That the internet is yeah. the, kind of the company for them. So bringing the culture through that interface, you know, how do you how do you show things that are well one relevant, but also keep employees engaged, interested, you know, push learning and development. Things like that. So, um, and culture of well, ERGs, yeah. employee resource groups, and all that is also one really, really important piece of it. Definitely. Yeah. definitely. One quick question. So, um, sure. mo most of the like employee portals or anything are generally like behind a VPN or something. Like, so is, were there any challenges like connecting with CDP or are in like uh, restrictions okay. over there? Sure. I don't know. Yes, definitely. So, yeah. <laughs> we're actually. Uh, doing a VPN tunnel on Azure yeah. to be able to do that because, yeah, more uh, uh, in most scenarios, yes, they're not exposed to the cloud. So we have an Azure tunnel that is from one side exposed and from the other side is through VPN tunnel into the internal network. Got it. Yes. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, must be. <laughs> All righty. Well, Mo, great presentation. Thanks a lot. Very insightful. Um, also kind of shows how easy it is to um, put something like that together. You know, JavaScript's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, so um, guys, everyone, um, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so this session was the entire thing was recorded. So in, um, within a few days, I'm actually going to be on um, I'm taking a vacation, going out to Denver for a few days. So it'll probably be early next week when I'm back. Uh, I'll uh, publish this. I'll share the link with everyone. Feel free to share it. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys again in uh, a couple months or so. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone.